In the previous video, we discussed Meniere's disease, which is a strange case because it begins as a peripheral hyperfunction, and then over time, as the inner ear gets more and more damaged, it transforms into a hypofunction. Vestibular neuritis is a plain and simple hypofunction. It's going to be caused by inflammation of the vestibular nerve, or the vestibular portion of cranial nerve 8. Remember, this is the nerve that transmits information from the semicircular canals and the utricle and the saccule to the brain, where it's interpreted as equilibrium or balance. Now, understand that vestibular neuritis is different from labyrinthitis. Labyrinthitis is inflammation of the entire labyrinth, and this is also associated with hearing loss. Pure vestibular neuritis is not associated with hearing loss, and it's only inflammation of the vestibular nerve. The prevalence of vestibular neuritis has it affecting 15 out of every 100,000 people in the United States. This makes it the second most common cause of vertigo, the most common cause being benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. Now the pathophysiology of vestibular neuritis is known. It's caused by a viral infection, and that viral infection causes inflammation and damage to the vestibular nerve. The most common viruses that cause this are the influenza virus and then several herpes viruses, the specific ones causing chickenpox, shingles, and cold sores. Now, there's a lot of us that at some point in our life have had influenza. But not all of us, in fact very few of us, have probably had vestibular neuritis. So just because you have influenza doesn't mean you're going to get vestibular neuritis. It just so happens that for whatever reason in some individuals, being infected with these viruses causes that inflammation of the vestibular nerve. But remember that vestibular neuritis, unlike labyrinthitis, does not lead to loss of hearing. Now the gold standard for diagnosing vestibular neuritis is an MRI or a CT scan. Remember, we've got inflammation of the vestibular nerve, and any time there's inflammation, there's going to be local fluid accumulation in that area. That fluid accumulation will show off on imaging techniques like an MRI. And so they're going to compare the left and the right sides, and they're going to see on one side there's going to be a little bit of fluid accumulation by that vestibular nerve. And that's going to confirm vestibular neuritis, in particular, if it's in conjunction with other symptoms like dizziness, vertigo, etc. So, let's suppose somebody presents to the physical therapy clinic complaining of dizziness. If they say they're dizzy, there's automatically several general conditions that you need to think about and rule out. The first one is the central vestibular deficit. So, you perform your oculomotor exam. So if somebody had a central vestibular deficit, they would have abnormal central signs from the oculomotor exam. They'd have an abnormal smooth pursuit, abnormal convergence, abnormal saccadic eye movement, abnormal VOR cancellation tests. But these first three tests here, head thrust test, gaze of oak nystagmus, head shaking nystagmus, these are peripheral tests. So these should be negative in an individual with a central vestibular deficit. Now remember that dynamic visual acuity, or DVA, is used to determine whether or not somebody has impaired gaze stabilization. If they have impaired gaze stabilization, then they're given a gaze stabilization exercise, like VOR times 1. And that can be the case in both central and peripheral vestibular deficits. So you cannot use the DVA as any differentiating factor, because it can be positive in both types of cases. Another cause of dizziness is BPPV. How do you rule this out? Well, you can use the BPPV diagnostic maneuvers, the dix hall pike maneuver and the horizontal roll maneuver. Assuming both of those are negative, the person likely does not have BPPV, you can rule it out and move on. And then finally, we have to consider the peripheral vestibular deficits or hypofunctions. Hypofunctions will likely have all four of these bullet points satisfied. A positive head thrust test, a positive gaze of oak nystagmus test, a positive head shaking nystagmus test, and an abnormal dynamic visual acuity. But there's a variety of hypofunctions. One would be the one we're talking about in this video, vestibular neuritis. There's also Meniere's disease, or just general hypofunctions. There's a lot of causes of those that don't have a specific name, like those caused by ototoxic drugs that damage the inner ear, or just simple age-related degeneration, age-related changes to vestibular function. That would fall into a hypofunction. So first, how would you differentiate Meniere's disease from vestibular neuritis?
Now, recall that vestibular neuritis does not have any loss of hearing, nor does it have tinnitus, whereas Meniere's disease has both of those. So if somebody either has hearing loss during their acute attacks or they're compounding some hearing loss that's more permanent over time, and they have tinnitus or ringing in the ears, that's more likely Meniere's disease, not vestibular neuritis. Case number two. If somebody has a history of taking an ototoxic medication, that makes it less likely it's vestibular neuritis. They simply took an ototoxic medication. So they have damage to the inner ear on one side. That would be more of a general hypofunction, just caused by an ototoxic medication. And then finally, case number three, vestibular neuritis. We already know that there's no hearing loss. There's no tinnitus, no ringing in the ears. You're going to have negative Dix Hull Pike, negative horizontal roll tests. You're going to have normal central tests in the oculomotor exam, and then positive or abnormal peripheral tests in the oculomotor exam. And then a big clue that somebody might have vestibular neuritis is if they have a recent illness where they were infected by a virus. In particular, remember the influenza and herpes classes of viruses, those causing chicken pox, shingles, and cold sores. If they had a recent infection by one of these viruses, that makes it more likely they have vestibular neuritis because those viruses are literally the cause of that inflammation to the vestibular nerve. Now, fortunately for treatment, vestibular neuritis usually goes away all on its own, and all a person really needs to do is rest to allow time for the vertigo symptoms to go away. The symptoms of vestibular neuritis are normally not as severe as they are for Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is just a beast. Now, if the person does have severe signs and symptoms, uh, some of them may be reduced with medications, in particular antihistamines or sedatives. Now, because vestibular neuritis normally goes away on its own, there are no lasting effects on balance or equilibrium. However, in severe cases of vestibular neuritis, there can be some lasting effects due to the severe inflammation and therefore damage to the vestibular nerve, after which it would present like a hypofunction. And with hypofunctions, what happens to gaze stabilization? It becomes impaired. And how do we treat impaired gaze stabilization? Well, we prescribe adaptation exercises or gaze stabilization exercises, the most common one being the VOR times one, which you see right here. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of vestibular neuritis and also how to differentiate it from other conditions that also cause dizziness. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.